Hello and welcome to HBS Pharmacy's webcast series. My name is Sally Drake and I'm the Clinical Communications Coordinator at HBS. This presentation is focusing on problem alcohol use. We'll be looking at some of the medications used in the management of acute alcohol withdrawal um, with a primary focus on medications used in the management of uh, long-term alcohol use disorder. So in 2020, the National Health and Medical Research Council released a revised version of the Australian guidelines to reduce the harms associated with alcohol consumption. So these updated recommendations advise that healthy men and women should limit their alcohol consumption to no more than 10 standard drinks per week and no more than four standard drinks on any one day. And in 2020, the statistics show that more than a quarter of adults exceeded these guideline recommendations. Um, so the figure is 33.6% for men and 18.5% in women. And there's also quite a significant difference between um, the uh, excessive consumption of alcohol in people who were born in Australia compared to Australians who were born overseas. And one standard drink is considered to contain 10 grams of alcohol. Um, and this obviously looks a little bit different when depending on the beverage concerned. Um, so for light beer, that's around 425 mils. Um, it's 100 mils for wine and down to 30 mils for spirits. And there's quite a number of risks associated with excess alcohol consumption. Uh, and they can be divided into acute risks and chronic risks. The acute risks tend to be quite obvious when we think about excess alcohol. So they're things like injuries, violence, unsafe sexual practices, and alcohol poisoning. Um, the chronic risks might not always be given the same amount of attention, but they're certainly quite significant, particularly when excess alcohol is uh, taken in over a prolonged period of time. So this would include things like liver disease, pancreatitis, an increased risk of many different cancers, malnourishment, cardiovascular disease, brain damage, psychological harm, financial issues, as well as relationship issues. An acute alcohol overdose can also be fatal. Um, this is particularly related to respiratory depression or aspiration of vomitus. And the average lethal alcohol concentration is around 0.45% to 0.5%. However, this can vary considerably depending on the person's uh, alcohol tolerance and if uh, other sedative agents have been consumed at the same time. And in general, uh, the management of acute alcohol overdose is just supportive therapy as required. And in 2018, the Australian Burden of Disease study showed that alcohol is quite a significant contributor to the total disease um, burden in Australia, being responsible for around 4.5% of the total disease burden. And this is made up of a 40% contribution to um, liver cancer disease burden, 25% of the burden due to road traffic injuries with uh, motor vehicle occupants, and 19% of the burden due to chronic liver disease. So it's really quite a significant in issue in this country. Um, so alcohol use disorder is the term given to um, this prolonged and excessive use of alcohol. Um, so this is a condition that is characterized by an impaired ability to stop or reduce um, alcohol consumption in spite of quite significant um, adverse effects, um, whether that's social impacts, occupational impacts, or health effects. Um, so the severity of this condition can vary quite markedly. However, however, it does tend to be a chronic relapsing and remitting condition. Um, so alcohol use disorder is quite common in Australia. It has a pre prevalence of around 4.4%. However, the majority of people do not seek active treatment. So for patients who do have quite a high dependence on alcohol, 
a syndrome of withdrawal can occur if they suddenly stop or significantly reduce their alcohol intake. Um, and this can present with things like anxiety, tremor, agitation, headache, perceptual disturbances, um, and in some cases, seizures can also occur. So an alcohol withdrawal syndrome typically develops within 6 to 24 hours and subsides after 72 hours, although in some people, the symptoms can persist for much longer. The treatment of alcohol withdrawal uh, is typically just supportive care and a low stimulus environment. Not everyone will require medical support for this. Um, however, benzodiazepines may be considered for the management of severe symptoms. Um, so diazepam is often used in this case at a dose of around 20 milligrams orally, um, repeated every two hours or so until symptoms subside. Um, diazepam does have quite a long half-life, um, and this can be quite significantly increased in people with hepatic impairment. So for patients with alcoholic cirrhosis, the half-life might be up to five times increased. Um, so in this case, a shorter acting benzodiazepine such as oxazepam may be preferred. And a thiamine supplement would also be used in this case um, as patients with alcohol use disorder do tend to be uh, deficient in thiamine. And this can be related to both uh, a reduced dietary intake, but also inhibition of absorption in people with alcohol use. Um, so typically the first few doses would be given uh, parenterally um, as the absorption from oral supplements can be quite slow, particularly in people who are malnourished or dependent on alcohol. So alcohol withdrawal delirium, uh, this is also known as delirium tremens or DTs, and this is just a much more severe presentation of alcohol withdrawal. Um, and this is considered a uh, medical emergency, which really needs to be managed within a hospital environment. Um, without appropriate treatment, this does have quite a high mortality rate, which is mostly related to heart failure. Um, the symptoms of uh, alcohol withdrawal delirium can include quite profound sedation, coarse tremor, agitation, fever, tachycardia, delusions, and hallucinations. And whilst this is a much more severe presentation, the general principles of treatment are quite similar. So um, diazepam, thiamin plus supportive care. However, for patients who do need a parenteral benzodiazepine, midazolam would be preferred to um, diazepam in this case. And some patients may also require a antipsychotic. So um, haloperidol as an oral agent, or droperidol or haloperidol as a parenteral agent, um, just bearing in mind that droperidol does tend to be more sedating than haloperidol. And hypoglycemia can be quite an issue in patients um, with alcohol use disorder. Um, and this is due to reduced glycogen stores as well as impaired gluconeogenesis. And the thing to remember here is that if glucose is required to be administered to these patients, um, thiamine really needs to be given before the glucose. Um, and this is to reduce the risk of developing Wernicke encephalopathy. Um, so this is a, a neurological condition that may present with confusion, uh, paralysis of eye muscles and ataxia. And it's caused by a deficiency of intracellular thiamine as thiamine is uh, required for normal glucose utilization. And so once we've moved on past the withdrawal stage, we need to consider the long-term management. Uh, Evidence-based treatment with behavioral therapies and uh, mutual support groups can help people with alcohol use disorder to um, achieve and maintain recovery. And treatment of any coexisting psychiatric conditions such as depression should also be addressed as this can help to improve overall outcomes as well. And medications can also be used to manage the disorder. However, it needs to be um, 
bear in mind that medications on their own tend to be quite ineffective. So disulfiram is the first agent that we'll look at here. Um, so this is used as a deterrent to alcohol consumption. It doesn't actually reduce cravings, but it does produce quite severe adverse effects if um, alcohol is consumed. Um, so it should only be used in patients who are quite motivated to abstain from alcohol, um, and also if they have someone available to supervise their administration. So disulfiram works as an inhibitor of um, the aldehyde dehydrogenase enzyme. Um, so ethanol is typically metabolized to acid aldehyde by uh, alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. Um, and acid aldehyde is quite a toxic metabolite, which is thought to be responsible for some of the adverse effects associated with alcohol consumption. And under normal circumstances, the uh, blood levels of acid aldehyde are quite low as it is quickly oxidized through to acetate here. And acetate has quite a, it is not as uh, active and is broken down and removed from the body quite quickly. Um, however, when uh, someone's taking disulfiram, this particular enzyme is inhibited which can lead to accumulation of acid aldehyde in the body. Um, so maximum in inhibition of this enzyme occurs after around three daily doses of uh, disulfiram. So in individuals who are receiving maintenance therapy, a disulfiram ethanol reaction can develop within five to 10 minutes of consuming alcohol. And due to the irreversible nature of this uh, inhibition here. The effect is quite prolonged uh, as restoration of enzymatic activity requires synthesis of new enzymes. So um, that means that this particular reaction with alcohol can still occur for seven to 14 days after the last dose of disulfiram. And the manufacturers also advise that the reaction can occur up to three weeks after the last dose. Um, so the symptoms of this reaction can include palpitations, tachycardia, uh, hyperventilation, severe coughing due to constriction and irritation of the throat and trachea, as well as blood pressure changes. Um, so this includes a sharp increase in blood pressure, which can then be followed by a decrease in blood pressure. Um, so a lot of these reactions are mediated by uh, vasodilation that results in uh, quite significant flushing of the face, um, the sclera, arms and chest, um, which would be accompanied by a feeling of heat, sweating, and also usually a headache as well. Um, so as these effects are really quite unpleasant, uh, patient selection is really important with disulfiram. So it should only be considered for patients who are likely to be deterred from drinking alcohol by the fear of these adverse effects. Um, and someone needs to be available to supervise its daily administration as well. Um, patients need to be fully informed of the nature of the disulfiram ethanol reaction um, and the potential for serious adverse effects if alcohol is consumed. Um, in the absence of alcohol, uh, adverse effects tend to be quite mild. Um, some common adverse effects include drowsiness, nausea, headache, and fatigue. Um, rarely it can be associated with peripheral neuropathy, hepatitis, psychosis, and blood dyscrasias. So monitoring of liver function and full blood count should occur during prolonged therapy. Um, so to ensure that these adverse effects with alcohol are avoided, patients need to be reminded to avoid all sources of alcohol. So this would include um, potentially some cough syrups, some mouthwashes, aerosol sprays, top topical lin liniments, as well as avoiding all alcohol in the cooking of food. Uh, the usual daily dose is 100 milligrams once a day 
for the first one or two weeks, and this can be increased up to 200 milligrams a day as a maintenance dose. Um, it isn't, however, available on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. So um, that might be a, a limiting factor financially for some people. And secondly, we have a camprosate, um, which is indicated to maintain abstinence. It is available on the PBS um, for alcohol dependence when used as part of a comprehensive treatment program. So the exact mechanism of action of a camprosate is not entirely known. However, the chemical structure is quite similar to that of inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA and taurine. And a camprosate is thought to reduce the neuronal hyperexcitability that occurs during alcohol withdrawal. Um, so a camprosate therapy should ideally begin just after the acute withdrawal process process has finished, so within about a week of um, ceasing alcohol, and should continue if relapse does occur. Um, so a camprosate is presented as 333 milligram enteric coated tablets, which should be swallowed whole with meals. And the usual dose is two tablets three times a day. Uh, for patients who weigh less than 60 kilos, a reduced dosing schedule may be considered of two tablets in the morning, one at midday and one at night. And therapy is usually continued for a year. Um, and it is primarily excreted in the urine, um, is not significantly metabolized at all and it is contraindicated in renal insufficiency. And next up, we have naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist. And this is also available on the PBS for the treatment of alcohol dependence within a comprehensive treatment program. So naltrexone can be used to reduce cravings for alcohol. Um, some of the pleasurable effects of alcohol are thought to be mediated by the release of endogenous opioids. Um, so endogenous opioids may be released in response to alcohol-related cues, such as even just the sight or the smell of alcohol for some people. So the main contraindication for the use of naltrexone would be chronic opioid therapy or opioid dependence with ongoing use. So in these patients, a potentially life-threatening opioid withdrawal program uh, syndrome could be precipitated. Um, and naltrexone is also contraindicated in acute hepatitis and liver failure, as it is quite extensively metabolized in the liver. It's also um, advised to avoid the combination with disulfiram, as they can both cause hepatotoxicity. And there's also a lack of evidence for any sort of add additive benefit of combining the two. Uh, side effects can include dizziness, fatigue, and sleeplessness. Uh, these effects tend to be most severe during the first um, few weeks of therapy and tend to reduce as therapy continues. So to summarise, alcohol use disorder is a chronic and complex condition that usually requires long-term management. There are three medications that are approved for the use of alcohol disorder um, and they each work in different ways and they each have their own individual advantages and disadvantages. So disulfiram, um, the dosing requires close supervision. For camprosate and naltrexone, they do reduce alcohol cravings uh, without producing those unpleasant effects associated with disulfiram. Compliance can be an issue for a camprosate as it does require three, three times daily dosing. Um, with naltrexone, obviously it can interfere with uh, therapies required for pain management. However, it does have the advantage of once daily dosing. And in terms of uh, availability, naltrexone and acamprosate are both available on the PBS. Um, and it's also worth uh, reminding you that medications on their own tend not to be that effective. So any kind of treatment for alcohol use disorder really needs to be 
combined with uh, psychosocial therapies as well. So thank you very much for attending this session. I hope that you found it interesting and um, useful for your practice. If you do have any questions or any feedback for me, please contact me directly at sally.drake at hbs.com.au. And if you would like to test your knowledge on this material, there is also a mini quiz, quiz available. Um, you'll find the link for your quiz on your email invitation, um, or you can also check the notes just below this video. Thank you again.